The success of big business in the Gilded Age had a dark side. It was the exploitation of labor. New technologies and innovations made workers less valuable to firms. Skilled and unskilled labor were replaced by new machinery and new equipment in all areas of the workforce. Workers received low wages. Wages were so low that everyone in the family needed to work in order for the family to survive, including young children. Working conditions were so dangerous that one in every 300 workers were either injured or killed on the job. Workers also faced long hours. Most workers had to work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, with no sick leave and no vacation. And poor sanitation. Most factories had dirty floors and poor ventilation, leading to health problems for the workers inside. Child labor was a common practice during the Gilded Age. Here you can see some images of children working. Children started working at the age of six. Children typically did dangerous work because they were able to manipulate machinery in ways that larger adults could not. They could reach into machines and fix them without having to take them apart. This also made children more prone to injury. Due to these conditions, workers demanded change. These workers followed the example of robber barons and merged and consolidated into monopolies of the workforce. These monopolies were called labor unions. Workers wanted to get better wages and better working conditions from their bosses. Among the earliest labor unions that formed in the United States was the National Labor Union, also known as the NLU. It linked 300 unions in 13 different states into one central labor union group. The main demand of the National Labor Union was for an eight-hour workday for all workers. Workers typically worked 12 to 14 hours a day. The next labor union is the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor focused on individuals and called for equal pay for women. As unions became more popular and union membership grew across the country, the representation began to splinter. More groups were needed to focus attention on specific types of workers. One such group was the American Federation of Labor, also known as the AFL. Founded by labor leader Samuel Gompers, the AFL organized skilled labor in what we call craft unionism. The craft in craft unionism refers to the fact that the workers represented by the AFL had specific skills that were valuable to their bosses. This made it harder to replace them and therefore made them more valuable. The next labor union is the Industrial Workers of the World, also known as the IWW. It was founded by Eugene V. Debs. Debs was a spokesman for industrial unionism. Debs organized unskilled and semi-skilled laborers. These are workers that typically worked in factories. Eugene V. Debs and the IWW believed that capitalist greed had failed American workers and called for a radical socialist revolution in America. Debs and his ideas became so popular that he ran for president under the Socialist Party in 1912, actually winning some votes. In order to achieve their goals, unions used diverse strategies. Some of these strategies were peaceful, some not so peaceful. One strategy was collective bargaining. Collective bargaining was when unions negotiated deals with their bosses as a group. The principle behind collective bargaining is strength in numbers. If you negotiate on your own, it's easier for your boss to deny what you want. If you negotiate as a group, it gives you a little bit more power in your negotiation. The next strategy that was used was strikes. Strikes are work stoppages in which unions would pressure firms with shutting down their factories with the threat of losing profits. Strikes were used in various degrees by various unions. The AFL struck often while the Knights of Labor used striking as a last resort. With their newfound power and different techniques of negotiation, there are several events that came to define the new era of labor organizing. The first was the Great Strike of 1877. Railroad workers struck over wage cuts that resulted in riots across the city, which was put down by federal troops. Scores of striking workers were killed, and the federal government asserted its power to regulate commerce in the Constitution by using force to put down a strike. The next event is the Haymarket Affair. In 1886, a labor protest rally near Chicago's Haymarket Square turned into a riot after someone threw a bomb at police. At least eight people died as a result of the violence that day. The third event is the Pullman Strike. Do you remember the town of Pullman, created by railroad magnate George Pullman? Workers eventually struck against Pullman and stopped all work in the town. In order to break up the effectiveness of the strike, Pullman brought in scabs. Scabs are workers who are hired to replace striking workers. Eventually, the Pullman Strike was broken up by the feds and the town collapsed. So why does it matter? 
Labor unions forced big business to consider workers when making their decisions. It was no longer purely about profit. It was now about working conditions and higher wages for their workers. Labor unions also become a political power in America. They make their voices heard with protests. And every politician who now runs for office must address the rights of workers and working conditions in order to get working votes. And finally, we celebrate Labor Day at the end of August and early September every year to commemorate the contributions of the labor movement in America.